Take your Bible, if you would, please. Let me make sure, yes, my power is on, my green light is on. I'm glowing green, which means I'll turn into the Hulk, probably. You imagine a preacher being the Hulk. Me start preaching, pounding on the pulpit, break the pulpit. All right, um, Ephesians 4, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for His grace, His blessing, uh, study His Word. Um, I, like, um, I like this part um, because it takes us to a place that we can't see. We have to, we have to use the Bible's eyes in order to see a place where people go to when they die, where everybody went to before Christ came. Um, not sure why God did it this way, but um, maybe one of these days I'll find it, find the answer in the scriptures. But um, I mentioned this a little bit last Sunday, and we're going to uh, work on it some more tonight. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it's a joy to come uh, in your presence tonight. I thank you, God, for uh, working uh, some good things in our hearts this morning. And Father, for the people that, uh, uh, that you spoke to, you visited with, I pray, dear God, that some people would be made free. I pray, Father, Lord, that uh, anybody with any kind of issue, doesn't have to be an addiction, Lord, it's just life. We are trying desperately to get through this world, to get home to Canaan land, to be with you forever. And Lord, there's many obstacles in our way. And we ask you, God, Lord, to uh, guide us always, lead us, help us along the way. And Father, Lord, just teach us uh, as you taught Joshua, a man that just showed no fear of what men could do to him or what giants could do to him. Uh, but he feared you. And I pray, dear God, that you would just bless us that way uh, tonight and throughout our lives. Bless uh, the word that uh, we preach on tonight. Pray, Lord, that uh, it would uh, go into our hearts and our souls and teach us things, Lord, that we can't see with our eyes. We can only see them through the pages of scriptures. And Lord, give us the meaning of it and the sense of it. We pray this in Jesus' name and amen. Ephesians chapter 4. Um, let me, um, I have verses 8 through 10, but let me back up a little bit uh, to, oh, I'll just start at the beginning of chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And remember, if you count those uh, from verse 4 to verse uh, 6, you have one body, one Spirit. One hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Seven things. Who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And um, this is where... All right. Um, this is where uh, a lot of people... Well, I won't say a lot of people. But some people... Um, get hung up. I've mentioned this before. They'll be in a church and they'll sit and judge other people. And I remember uh, Brother Pete Rubel, who was used to be the pastor over here at Lighthouse Baptist. He told me this one time. He had a guy in his church that anytime he found out anything about somebody that they had done some, some big wrong or something like that, he was always running to the pastor. Pastor, I think we need to have church discipline on him. I think we need to call a meeting. And he's like, wait a minute. 
there's a process here. Let's, let's do it the Bible way and see if we can't restore them and bring them back instead of let's go ahead and bayonet them now and kill them and get it over with. Um, yeah, somebody, somebody wrote this, uh, Christianity is the only army in the world that bayonets its own wounded. Yeah, and I'm going, boy, what a, what a terrible thing. Uh, but anyway, um, some people need more grace. Some people need more grace. And it's not our call to decide who gets it and who doesn't. God knows how to do it. God knows how to, and God knows how much mercy somebody needs. God knows how much grace somebody needs. God knows all of this. And besides that, it's a gift. And you know how, I think it's, I think it's human nature. We learn it when we're young. That when we see somebody at Christmas getting more presents or better presents than we get, what's the first thing we do? We get mad, we get jealous. We get irate, and instead of enjoying what we got, we're mad because somebody else got more, or somebody else got better ones. And that verse, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And in that story where the woman washed Jesus' feet, I mentioned that in this, um, Jesus just flat out told him she loves me more because she's been forgiven of more. So now in verse 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, what it, and here's what I think this means. When he ascended up on high, that is Acts chapter 1, where Christ is ascending up in the cloud, and the disciples are going. And then two angels are standing there and they're the angels. I can just see the angels walking up and going. What are you guys looking at? Well, Jesus just went up there. Yeah, I know. He's not there anymore. Why stand ye gazing? This same Jesus. He's coming back. Don't worry. Amen. Uh, it's a good thing that they didn't still stand there saying, when is he coming back? And I, listen, I guarantee you, if, that would have, if I would have been there, I would have been looking up all day long. I would have. I would have been looking up all day long. He said he's coming back. Yeah. Anyway, I'd, sl I'd have slept outside and just laid there and go, anyway. Uh, I've got to move on. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. What does that mean? We're going, to, we're going to see it. And gave gifts unto men, which is interesting because after he ascended, he gave them the gift of the Holy Ghost. Is it a gift or do you earn it? So if you, it's a gift and you don't earn it, then why is it that these churches who claim that you get baptized or you get filled with the Holy Ghost and to them Holy Ghost is one word Holy Ghost you ought to, you ought to, you ought to be baptized in the Holy Ghost it's one word and they they cannot understand that if I'm meant to have that by God he's going to give it to me without me asking for it without me and I there's nothing wrong with asking for it but I've asked God for things that he didn't give me. He gave me things better than what I asked for. So I just don't understand these churches that they expect you to show some indication that you have had a supernatural encounter. And when they see that, then they deem that you have now been filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's not how it works. The disciples were told to go to Jerusalem and wait. And so what were they doing on the day of Pentecost? Waiting. Okay? And then all of a sudden, boom! Rushing mighty wind. So all of this is happening after he ascended up on high. When he ascended up on high, 
He led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men. Now, verse 9. Now, he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? So now the Bible's telling us before he ascended up, he descended down to the lower parts of the earth. Um, verse 10. And he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all what? Heavens. The first one, second one, that he might fill all things. And then uh, verse 11, uh, very quickly, gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, um, there is a picture or several pictures of this uh, in your Bible, and I think I have, I think I have them out of, yeah, I want to go to Luke 16, Mick. I want to go to that. So turn your Bible to Luke 16. And then I'm going to go back to Genesis, okay? In Luke 16, uh, we have Jesus describing for us, and he would know what it looks like because he made it. And it probably looks exactly the same as when he, when he made it, all right? He made the lower parts of the earth. And let me just throw in a little cosmology for you. It's not women putting makeup on. Cosmology, cosmology is um, the study of the cosmos, the heaven, earth, and I am geocentric. this out I've looked at the and I've looked at, uh, the scientific evidence and they are not in disagreement I what's it doing check one two check one two huh All right. Um, I think the I think the sun is right where science says it is. That that to me matches what I see in Revelation chapter one. We have Christ standing there and his face shining like the sun. So he's the sun. You have the seven stars. He's in the midst of them. The seven stars are around him, and that is a picture of from Earth view. You have Mercury, Venus. Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Seven stars. Seven planets. Seven stars from the Earth's viewpoint. And it's a perfect picture of our solar system. Um, having said that, though, to me, it's interesting that God put the place where all of the devils the devil himself and all of his angels, he put them not on Mars, not on Jupiter. Jupiter would be a good place for them. They'd be crushed. Mercury would be a good place for them. It's hot on Mercury. Okay. But he put them at the heart of this world, which tells me that everything in this world, universe and i'm telling you i love looking at pictures of stars i just stare at them and just the number of stars in our galaxy will blow your mind when you figure about how big that is and how far apart they are multiply that times the number of galaxies that we can see and then the ones we can't. The James Webb telescope was put up there to be able to see farther than the Hubble telescope. And the James Webb telescope, this is what's funny. The scientists said all along that the universe was about 13 billion years old, which means that at the Big Bang, there was a massive explosion of mass and it just shot out 
into space. And it took a few billion years for these galaxies to form and all these stars to form. Which is interesting to me. How come all the galaxies, let's say on the left side of the Big Bang, all turned out the same way as the galaxies on the right side of the Big Bang? And the ones on the front side and the back side and the upside and the downside, how come they all turned out looking the same? How come just about every star is practically the same? Some are bigger than others. But anyway, all of that, all of that, and God's whole focus is right here on this earth, this world. <sighs> I'm getting doodads. I am. I'm getting doodads. I love this. So now, let's look into this place. So in Luke 16, 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, a place in the heart of the earth where there is comfort. Abraham was the father of those who had faith. So we are sons of Abraham by faith. Abraham had faith and all of those who are born of Abraham and who have faith, they are in his bosom. Place of comfort. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell. It, notice that it never tells you what happened to Lazarus' body. Didn't tell you what happened to Lazarus' body. The beggar died and was carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. We know it wasn't his flesh. Um, and, I, and I do believe that it's possible that that's the Bible's way of telling you. For a righteous person, it doesn't matter what happens to the, to the body. It does not matter. And I've had people ask me about um, cremation. I've had people ask me about different burial ways. Some say that even putting them in a mausoleum is wrong. Um, because that's not burying them. I see no scripture commandment that says people have to be buried six feet under. Um, in fact, we actually work against people turning back to dust because we embalm bodies and we put them in caskets and then we put them in vaults and then cover them up with dirt and the dirt never touches them. So anyway, um, so we don't know what happened to Lazarus' body, but apparently it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't count. Um, so in hell, verse 23, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried. And now that right there is going to be a real form of torture and punishment. Because all of these people in hell burning and in torments and yet they're seeing people in Abraham's bosom being comforted and not in torments. And they're watching that and they would give anything to be able to be on the other side. God is letting them see what they missed. God's letting them see that apparently. And so he says in verse 24, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that, I, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime. Note, and notice the language here. The rich man calls Abraham Father Abraham. Abraham calls him Son. Which tells us that just because you're a Jew, you don't go to heaven. You can be a Jew, a good Jew, and not go to, and go to hell. And so it's only by faith that Lazarus gets to be where he is. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. So there we have it. Two places in the heart of the earth. One a place of torment. One a place of comfort. And beside all this, 
between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, a great expanse, an empty place, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So, we know, number one, that there is a place down here, the heart of the earth, where every evil angel, no matter what galaxy they're in, no matter what, uh, how far away they are, no matter what, uh, they're coming here to be put and punished right here. And, and to me, it's interesting that after God destroys all of this creation with fire, that he makes a new heaven and what? A new earth. So that's, that's my geocentricity. I believe that this earth is the absolute center of everything in God's plan. Okay? So I don't believe... You, you hear me talk about UFOs, you hear me talk about aliens, you hear me talk about all these things. I do not believe that there are inhabitants of other planets that God likewise has some sort of plan for them. C.S. Lewis did. Uh, if you've never read his space trilogy, I did. And apparently, I don't know if he made this up and didn't believe it or he heard it from somebody and believed it. But he had people being born on Mars and living on Mars. He had people being living on Venus. And it's just weird. But anyway, so now we have a picture of what, ha what is at the heart of the earth. There is a, two places. They are separated by a vast gulf that apparently is so wide and so deep and so far from each other that they cannot... Pass from one to the other. Now, how can that be in, in just the physical core of the earth? Because we, we would think that here's the surface of the earth. And as you get closer to the middle, the distance is getting closer to each other. Does that make sense to everybody? So we're not talking about something in this dimension. Something in a higher dimension. Fourth dimension. That where our distances won't matter there. So there's a gulf there that separates between them. Nobody can go from Abraham's bosom to hell. Nobody can go from hell to Abraham's bosom. Even if they wanted to, they can't do it. God separated them. So... Uh, when we go back to Ephesians, that's what he meant. He ascended up on high. He led captivity captive. And I don't have this verse down, but this all goes to, um, let's see here. The thief on the cross who believed that Jesus was the Savior. Luke 23, 43, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So, uh, some, some people believe that where Abraham's bosom was at that time was paradise. It's possible. It's possible because we know that day where, where Jesus went. He went here, down here. And this thief on the cross followed with him, apparently. Now, what is Jesus doing down there? Well, that's where we get back to this. Genesis 40. Turn there. Now, we studied uh, last week the, the verses that actually declare that Jesus went to the heart of the earth and he preached the spirits in prison. Uh, and, and we also have another verse... And these, these are coming from Peter, that it was the gospel that Jesus was preaching. Well, what is he preaching salvation for down there? Why is he doing that? Well, we know that all the people who died before Christ 
They didn't know who Jesus Christ was. They knew that, that the Lord was there. They knew him as uh, the angel of the Lord. They knew him as the rock that followed them. They knew him as the bread that came down from heaven. They knew him as uh, the, the ark uh, of Noah. They knew him as the high priest. They knew him in all these different ways, but they didn't know who he was. So now I believe Jesus goes down there and he goes to those in Abraham's bosom first, possibly paradise, and says, hi, it's me. Okay, and he preaches to them the gospel. Genesis 40. Um, this story here, to me, explains in typology what was going on there. Verse 1, it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Uh, and Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the what? Prison. That's, that's where Peter said that Jesus went to. He preached his spirits in prison. So here we have a prison. We have two guys, the baker and the butler. The place where Joseph was bound. Joseph is Jesus in this story. Okay, playing the part of Jesus will be Joseph. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. So they were there for a period of time. Now, in verse 9, the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, behold, a vine was before me. Let's, t let's look at that. Who's that vine? That's Christ. Okay, I am the vine, you're the branches. And in the vine were three branches. And it was as though it budded and her blossoms shot forth and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. In other words, he sees these three branches and then boom, all of a sudden... They budded, then their blossom shot forth, and then all of a sudden they grew into clusters right there in front of his eyes. Um, and you now he's got ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said, now this is new wine. This is fresh new wine. It came right from the cluster. Isaiah says that. New wine is from the cluster. So Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Three days, Jesus was in the heart of the earth. Three days, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Okay. So quite possibly looking at something that yet pertains to the future. He said, um, the three branches are three days, yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. It's restoration. Remember that. Restoration. It's what we strive for in dealing with people is restoration. Then, the Baker. When the baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. That's some trick. Okay? Even the Kenyans can only carry one. Okay? But they got three. And in the uppermost basket, there was all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh. And the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. Remember the parable of the seed and the sower. What happens to seed by the wayside? The fowls of the air come and eat it, devour it. And, the, and Jesus said the fowls of the air are the wicked one, Satan. So now we understand a little bit these three baskets and the birds, which are spirits, 
prince of the power of the air and so on. They're eating all the good, good bread out of this basket. So there's none left. And so the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. So the baker's going, ooh, that's just like the butler. So far, so good. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head. Oh, that's what he said about the, the butler. He lifted up his head from off thee. And shall hang on a tree. And the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. That's not what the baker wanted to hear. So, here's Jesus. He goes down to... Um, well, let me finish reading Genesis 40, verse 20. And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday that he made a feast unto all his servants and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler into his butlership again and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph but forget him. See, Joseph made a deal with him. When you guys get out of here, mention my name. Okay. Well, it didn't happen then. They forgot him. Well, the baker forgot him the most because <laughs> he got his head anyway. Um, but they forgot him. And it wasn't until uh, later when Pharaoh had a dream that the butler went, I know a guy. He's in prison. You'll have to get him out of there, but I know a guy. So anyway, that's what happened. So here's Jesus. And... He goes, he goes to the lower parts of the earth and he's preaching the gospel. He's preaching and telling them the good tidings of great joy to everybody there. First, to Abraham's bosom. And he's saying to everybody in Abraham's bosom, in three days, we're coming up out of here and we're going to go and I'm going to lead you up to heaven. We're going to set you free from this place. And everybody in Abraham's bosom is, yay, woo, all right. We're getting out of here. Then he turns to hell. Where, since Jesus told this Story. It's something I want you to understand. Uh, what I th believe about these parables. I believe they were real people. And I had this conversation with Jehovah's Witness on my doorstep one day. And they said, because I, I mentioned to them the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And they said those parables were made up stories. And I said, no, 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 no. Jesus did not say, suppose there was a rich man. And suppose there was a man named Lazarus. He said, there was a certain rich man. When he told the uh, uh, parable of the widow's might. True story. Uh, when he gave the parable of um, oh, the woman who gave a penny at the temple. Jesus knew her. I mean, he, I believe those stories were real. And I believe Jesus knew who this Lazarus was. And I believe Jesus knew who this rich man was. And so when Jesus, all of a sudden now, this rich man, now watch this. This rich man is asking Abraham to let Lazarus go back from the dead and talk to his loved ones. Okay. Well, the rich man is in hell. Jesus shows up and the rich man's going, oh, no. And so Jesus preaches the gospel. But in this case, he's telling them, I died. You see all these people in Abraham's, I died to pay every one of their punishment for their sin. I gave my own life. I shed my own blood. 
I am the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And you see these people, you know some of them, and you know that they were sinners while they were on this earth. But they trusted the Lord. They had faith in the Lord. I'm the Lord. And I died for them, and they believed in me before they even knew me. And I love that, 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 um, that one thief on the cross who believed Jesus was going to rise from the dead before he ever died. Because when he said, uh, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He hadn't died yet. He believed he was going to rise from the dead and have a kingdom. And the, and the thief knew that. He believed it. And he called him Lord. So that fulfills Romans 10, 9 and 10. Uh, for, uh, help me out here. Uh, if we believe, if, if we believe in our heart, yeah, something like that. If we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, if, if we, yeah, you guys know what it means. Anyway. So he's doing exactly what Romans 10, 9 and 10 says before Romans 10, 9 and 10 was written. He's got it in him. He believes it. He, and so he's in, Jesus is like, see these guys here? They're all going to heaven. They trusted in me before they even knew me. They trusted me. They trusted the word of God. They trusted the words of the prophets. They listened to the prophets. They listened to the law being read to them. They said, amen, amen. They did all of those things. You had that opportunity and you didn't do it. Your forefathers had the opportunity to follow the true God and they didn't do it. And so, according to Romans 1, there's something about mankind that God instills in him a knowledge of who God is without the gospel even being preached. And they have it right in front of them and they just pay no attention to it. And so Jesus says, you're going to be lifted up out of here. You're going to be given a new body. And then you're going to be judged and you're going to be judged by all the things that you did. And I'm going to take those things and I'm going to put them in charge against you. And your punishment is when you get out of here, you're going to be cast into the lake of fire, which burneth forever and ever. Hell and death both are going to be cast into the lake of fire. And that's where you're going to be. And I believe according to, uh, turn to Isaiah 66. I believe that we will see them. Isaiah 66, not Luke. Come on, give me Isaiah. There we go. Let's see here, 22, I think, or right, right toward the end. Yeah. Look at verse 23, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. He mentions in verse 22, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make shall remain before me. So we know what time we're in. We're in the new heavens and the new earth. And then he says in verse 24, and they shall go forth. And look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. Does that sound familiar to anybody? It's exactly what Jesus said. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. And I believe that that speaks of the lake of fire and that we will see all of those down in the lake of fire. And we will abhor their judgment, God's wrath upon them. They, it's possible they will be able to see us just like the rich man did. See Lazarus being comforted. And it's going to be yet, if that's true, it's going to be yet another part of their punishment. Is that they will see the people who trusted in Jesus Christ for their salvation, 
had simple faith. Even a, even a child believing and trusting in his or her heart that Jesus died on the cross. I was nine years old and I believed it. I believed every word of it. And um, they're going to see all of those people enjoying the pleasures and the beauty of heaven. And, they're, and they know they're not ever, ever going to get to go there. Whew. I don't want to go to hell. I never want to go to hell. I'm glad that I have a Savior who died for me. Amen. Uh, so, all right, we covered that. Uh, oh, turn back to Luke 16. This is where it gets interesting. Uh, Luke 16, 27. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and prophets. And you, know, you know what he's saying? They have a Bible. And, this, and the Old Testament warns about hell. Okay? The Psalms. Um, the wicked are turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. That right there tells you that wicked people go to hell. And it also tells you that when you neglect God, when you forget Him and forsake Him, He forsakes you and you go there. Um, Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they pers be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. One did. The very same one, Jesus, rose from the dead, and he's telling everybody about hell, and nobody believes it. Almost nobody believes it. Straight is the way, narrow is the gate. And Jesus himself said, few there be that find it. If you have found the way to heaven, rejoice and tell God thank you. Tell him thank you. Because he has done for you. Man, I don't even like to think about it. Um, Isaiah 45 let me read this very quick. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and His Maker, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. Uh, I like to use this verse to all the flat earth people. They believe... They believe that the earth is a flat pancake and it has like a dome shell over it and that dome is the heavens and that's all it is, is a dome, like a snow globe. I'm not making that up, that's the analogy they use. And these people are so dumb and so willfully ignorant. Um, you show them verses like this. I've stretched out the heavens. The heavens are still moving, by the way. Okay? They're getting farther and farther apart. God's stretching out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness and will direct all his ways. He shall build my city. He shall let go my captives. There it is. Not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. What does it take to be set free by God? How much does it cost? None. Um, the lady that we had here Wednesday night, um, she had a few 
problems, a few issues. Um, and I want you to pray for her. Her name was Heather. She, um, she said she went to First Baptist and then she went to the church behind First Baptist, which is the Catholic church. And she said, I liked that church because you could go in and confess all your sins. Okay? She gave Sister Betty the rosary that she got over there. That's what you had. She picked up, a, they have free rosaries over there apparently. And she gave it to, I have it on my desk. Let's, let's just say that even if the priest over there can forgive the sins that you confess to him, there's one thing that he cannot do. He cannot make people free from those sins. He can't do it. Only, and by the way, they take price and reward for their forgiveness of sins. It's going to cost you. Jesus set the captives free for nothing. Amen. Isaiah 61 the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. That's what the word gospel means, good tidings. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to who? The captives. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. That's all of those people. Uh, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Now, Jesus quoted that in Luke 4. And I like this picture here. This is a picture, if you've been following me on uh, Sunday school, teaching about Jesus taking the book from God's right hand and opening the book. He's doing it here. He's acting it out. He's showing you how the Bible works. He, cometh to, he came to Nazareth, this is Luke 4, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. How many chapters does it have? 66, so it's a picture of the Bible. When he had opened the book, just like in Revelation, when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel. See, that's what the word gospel means. It means good tidings. The gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. If you compare those two places, he cut it off mid-sentence. He took a breath. And then he closed the book. And this is, how, this is how your DNA works. It works exactly this way. And this is how the Bible works. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, if you notice, after he said to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, he stopped reading right there and closed the book. Because it wasn't time for the day of vengeance of our God. It wasn't time for that yet. That day is coming later. The time that he was referring to is to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, which is now. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. The eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. 66 words there exactly. From the book where he's reading from the book that has 66 chapters in it. That's made to look like the Bible that has... 66 books in it. That's pretty good, Jesus. That's pretty good. Um, but that's what he's going to do. He's going he's to proclaim that they are free. i got a lot more verses to go, but we'll wait. Mm -mm -mm. I'm looking at this verse in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. The, uh, saith the Lord of hosts that I will break his yoke from off thy neck. I'd rather have God break his yoke from my neck than break my neck. <laughs> Amen. Let's stand.